And welcome to Let Them Talk. I'm Paul DiRienzo, and we have a great show planned for you today. My guest in the studio live is William Pepper, attorney at law, who's here to discuss, well, this is the 50th anniversary coming up of the Kennedy assassination. Some of you might not know, except maybe from your history books, if you weren't around back then, uh, that there we had a president by the name of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, JFK. And he was, after three years in office, a tumultuous three years, a very busy three years, he was assassinated in a still unsolved, at least it's my opinion and the opinion I think of my guest, William Pepper, that it's an unsolved crime, and that he was assassinated in Dallas on November, Dallas, Texas, November 22nd, 1963. 50 years ago, coming up pretty soon. And we're going to talk a little bit about that assassination, but we're going to talk about some aspects of the Kennedy assassination that have not been dealt with very much, at least, somewhat, but not a lot. And we're going to be give you some information that you might not have uh, if you're interested in just who might have been behind the Kennedy assassination and maybe the important question of the motivation, why whoever did it, did it. Now, uh, William Pepper, interesting person. He works for the King family. He's the lead counsel for Sirhan Sirhan, who's the uh, convicted assassin in the uh, uh, assassination of JFK's brother, who had been the attorney general at that time, Robert F. Kennedy. The, that assassination occurred in 1968. And also he's been, wrote a book and has been doing investigations into the assassination of Martin Luther King and who was really responsible for that. And I'm sure other work as well. But I think that'll, that's enough right there to start off. So um, William Pepper, how did you get into the assassination game, investigating presidential and, and uh, the assassination of important people, uh, especially important people to progressives. How did this happen? How did this come about? Well, um, I worked with Martin King the last year of his life. I, I was quite close to him the last year of his life. I guess I w was the one that f compelled him to oppose the war in Vietnam. I was a journalist in Vietnam in 1966. He read my work in uh, Ramparts in uh, January of 1967 and saw the photographs of the burned and uh, decimated uh, civilian population and children in particular and asked to meet with me. So then I met with Martin and uh, he asked me to open his file, my files for him. I did. And he wept. And he said, oh my God, he said, I must now formally, finally oppose this war. So I started him down that road in February, March of 67. And then he came to me in March and said, look, I'd like you to, I'd like you to lead a group that I'm putting together with a coalition across the country called the National Conference for New Politics. And that organization will promote uh, the end of the war, but also an alternative to the candidacy of Lyndon Johnson. So uh, and it, it, it made a lot of sense to me, so I agreed to do that. I worked very closely with him, Ben Spock and others, uh, was to be a King Spock ticket. That was abortive because we were naive, we were young, and <laughs> government came in, infiltrated, subverted, and it killed off that third party candidacy. Mm -hmm. So they, they ended that. Martin was then killed uh, in April of uh, 1968. Spock and I and others went to the funeral and the memorial in Memphis and then in Atlanta. And Bobby Kennedy asked, us, asked me to come up. I had been Bobby's citizen's chairman mm -hmm. in Westchester County when he ran for the Senate in New York State. He chose me, I was a very young guy, chose me because I had such a large following of young people, sort of like reformers, good mm -hmm. government people. So Bobby said, will you do this? And I agreed to do it. And um, I handled that campaign for him. And then it was 64. They killed, I went to Vietnam in 66 and I, other things in between in human rights. What did and you do in Vietnam? In Vietnam I was just a journalist, but I was an accredited journalist. Uh, and uh, Mac V accredited me, and I, but I went out of the country most of the time. I was in, I was out in, uh, 
I was in refugee camps and orphanages and places like that, and I didn't attend the Friday briefings. <laughs> <laughs> and I started to make the, them the nervous. o'clock follies, yeah. used to call them, right? And, <laughs> and I started to make them nervous. So Commander Madison called me in. I, I had I was out in Pleiku. I had been hit in a plane that was shot, hit on the way down, hurt my back. I had to come back to, into Saigon, and um, I went to a party with some friends. The North Vietnamese didn't know you were a good guy. They were they, no, they didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> They're shooting at you in the airplane. Know that. Right. And I went to a party with some friends, and a young Vietnamese woman attached herself to me. And she said, what are you seeing out there? What's going on? What you're thinking about all this? And, you know, and again, naivete comes through, and I was honest. And I said, this is an incredibly uh, torturous war. Uh, the terrorism that America is imposing on your people is just incredible. We've killed, I'm sure, millions. But it's the children that bother me the most. I gave the whole thing with her. And the next morning I was called down to Commander Madison who said, we understand you're not too happy about what's going on here. We think maybe it's time for you to go home. And I said, oh, go they home. They were spying on you as a well, journalist? <laughs> I mean, she was a plant, obviously. I said, go home. Well, I'd like to go, <coughs> before I go home, I'd like to go out to Tainin. What do you want to go to Tainin? It's controlled by the Kong. I said, I want to go to Tainin because they have this leprosarium there. And I believe, you know, lepers in most societies are regarded as the dregs of this. And I would like to see how they're treated by the... National Liberation Front, the Viet Cong, because on that basis you can draw a lot of conclusions about the culture and the people. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I'd like to go in there. He looked at me and he rolled his eyes and he said, oh, he says, oh. I said, I need a chopper to go in because it's controlled by the, uh, by the uh, right. Kong. And he said, oh, we can't give you a chopper, but we'll give you a jeep. And a driver. This is before embedded. Like today, we have embedded, right? Oh yeah. Right. Well, this I was is never embedded. <laughs> Instead of embedded, they just give you a jeep and say, "Go into oh. enemy territory." Oh yeah, I was never embedded. So they said, "I'll give you a jeep." So I said, "Well, I'll get back to you on that." So I talked to some of my friends. Said, "Bill, the last guy they gave a jeep to was found by the side of the road. He was mm -hmm. killed. Forget it. Go home. You're a marked man now. Mm -hmm. They don't trust you. They know what you. Go home. I never wrote anything. I never developed any of my photographs at that point." to said, go home. So I took the advice and I, uh, I, got, I got out of there. And that's when, of course, I published Ramparts Magazine, did the, this incredible piece. And uh, that's how I met Martin King. OK, so I, I met Martin in and, 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 uh, 67. And he were, we were close to 67, 68. He spoke at the National Conference of New Politics, which is probably the most democratic convention America's ever had, 5,000 delegates from every walk of life, from the liberals, the sane people, all, to the Mississippi Free Where Democratic was Party. It was held in Chicago, the Palmer House. And as Martin delivered the keynote, I introduced him, he delivered the keynote address, a note was passed over my shoulder. I looked at this note and it said, get him out of here after he speaks or we'll, we will abduct him and embarrass him before the world. This was a note passed to me by a group that was called the Black Caucus. We didn't know at the time, didn't know for years later, they were, they were Blackstone Rangers types. They were, they were Mayor Daley's uh, hoodlums, and they organized all the blacks who were coming in, and they subverted the whole damn thing. So I got Martin out of there. Then they killed Martin in uh, April of 68. I said, I'm through with politics. <laughs> had it. So Bobby says, come work with me, help me. And I said, Bobby, I'm through. I don't want to do with this. I went off and I developed uh, you know, experimental schools. I got an education. I got a doctorate education and all that stuff. Nine years later, Abernathy talks to me and says, Bill, I'm not sure about what really happened to Martin. Would you go up with me to the prison and interview James Earl Ray? So I said, well, what are you talking about? James O'Reilly was arrested and convicted yeah. of the, yeah. the murder. Yeah. I said, what are you talking about? Didn't they got the right guy? He said, I don't know. what." So I, I, I said, Ralph, it's going to take me. To, I didn't know anything about the case. I studied five, six months. I didn't, we went up to the prison. I spent five hours interrogating Ray with enormous um, uh, tension and pressure. We all came away and said, this guy didn't. This guy didn't do it. We don't know what role he played, but he didn't do it. Ten years thereafter, he raised so many questions, I started an investigation. 
he kept asking me to represent him, and I refused for 10 years. Finally, 1988, I became his lawyer. James Orray's lawyer. Yeah, and from 88 to 98, I was his lawyer. We failed to get him a trial. We were denied cert by the Supreme Court. We couldn't do it. Finally, in 99, I said, the King family, Coretta came to me and said, what do we do? We, you know, we don't have closure on this. I said, let's do a civil action, because I had identified a critical guy who was a part of the whole conspiracy. Mm. Who was that? Lloyd Jowers. He owned the grill, the bar, behind which, in the brushes, the, sh the shooter was, the king was killed. A lot mm. of planning went on in the bar itself. He took the gun from the actual shooter, brought it into the kitchen, and of course it wasn't James O'Reilly, right, James was Patsy. So I got Lloyd, we nailed Lloyd, he was a patsy. You used the word patsy? He was a patsy, yeah. Okay. We nailed Interesting. him. Interesting, yeah. And Lloyd, Lloyd Jowers admitted the whole thing. So we sued him in order to bring out a case which the American people don't even know ever took place. 1999, 30 days, 70 witnesses before a judge, Memphis, Tennessee, the whole truth about the assassination of Martin King came out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the King family finally had... An and unofficial closure. trial, basically. No, an it actual official civil trial. Okay. And we, it took the jury 59 minutes to come back after 70 witnesses in 30 days and said, Go, agents of the government of the United States, state of Tennessee, city of Memphis, were responsible for the murder of Martin King. So you're not saying that it was the Ku Klux Klan, it was right-wingers, no, no, no. it was fascists. No, no. You're saying that it was an actual hit by members of our own United States government. Oh, the government killed Martin King. They couldn't. He was going to bring half a million people to Washington mm -hmm. just after that Memphis uh, appearance. Half a million people in this were going to not march, not demonstrate, stay there, mm -hmm. visit their Congress people, try to get social programs refunded. And the Army knew, and they were right, that they were going to be frustrated in trying to get their congressmen to do this. And it could erupt into a violent uh, conflagration that they couldn't control. They didn't have the troops to control it. They knew mm -hmm. it. Martin was never going to be allowed to bring that mob to Washington. Never. So they had to kill him. No, he was killed. Um, uh, uh, Hoover uh, put up the money J. through... J. Edgar Hoover, who was at the time the head of the... FBI. He put up the money uh, to arrange Ray's escape a year before. The warden was paid twenty-five thousand. I've so said he escaped from prison. Yeah, at one prison. point he actually escaped from prison. James, yeah, he was a prisoner on some minor charge, and they profiled him. And they, this is the guy we need. And they kept him. They moved him around the country. And finally, Martin was originally to be hit in Los Angeles. And I wonder why that didn't happen, and why all of a sudden they moved it to Memphis. And then I realized, well, they had targeted Los Angeles for Bobby. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't have two assassinations in the same city. So they moved Martin's assassination to Memphis. They set it all up there, moved James into New Orleans, Birmingham, and then Memphis. Had him totally under the control of a guy called Raul. The government says never existed. He existed. I know who he is, that all of that. Yeah. James being James Ray, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, who you were representing by this time. I mean, uh, yeah, so I mean, it, 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 it was a white, working class type of guy from Quincy, Illinois, who was ideal for this. Mm -hmm. ideal. So they used him, and they set up the assassination of Martin. Martin was hit. Um, the military didn't kill him. The Army had an, a 184 sniper unit there, but they didn't kill him. They were backups. They were just never going to let him get out of there. He was yeah. killed by uh, a professional hitman. Okay, we're speaking with William Pepper, who is the attorney, as you said, for the King family. He was the attorney for the, assa the accused and convicted assassin of Martin Luther King, who he claims and shows uh, here that uh, did not do this crime. And in fact, it was a government hit squad uh, backed up by the United States Army. Um, and yet, you sit, still sit here with us, and the Army, you must not be a popular guy in the military. <laughs> <laughs> Your name has come up once in a while in the Pentagon, right? It's yeah, well, I, I moved my family to England in 1981. I had three little kids. And um, I 
when my four-year-old son started getting take, picking up the phone and hearing the death threats against his father, I said, "There's no way to raise uh, raise a, raise a family." Mm -hmm. So I moved them to I moved them to England. My children were raised in Cambridge. I I then com commuted back to America for a good number of years. But I, I, uh, I believe I never became a serious enough threat mm -hmm. to them. They had the lid on uh, all of the m mainstream media. Mm -hmm. I never became a serious enough threat. So they could e actually point to me and they could, I could be an asset to them. They could say, mm -hmm. look, <laughs> we let these guys mm -hmm. say what they want, write what they want, you know. But it's only when you really get to the point where you threaten them and the, re the real power structure of the, of the country, that, you know, uh, political assassination is the ultimate tool. All right, let's jump to the next one because Robert F. Kennedy, a, a former Attorney General of the United States, brother of the President, uh, why would they kill him? He was a member of the ruling elite. No. No. No, no, no. Bobby was going to reopen the assassination of his brother. He was going to convene, and uh, if he got the White House, he's going to convene it. He told that to Bill Atwood, who was the uh, managing editor of Look Magazine. Uh, Bill called him at 1 o'clock in the morning after a meeting with Jim Garrison. And he said, Bobby Garrison has just shaken me to my toes about it. Jim Garrison was the one who... New Orleans district attorney. Is fe who, featured in the film JFK. Yes, yeah. yeah. And Bob said to him, Jim, I know that. I mean, uh, uh, I, 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 I know, we know what happened, but I need to get the White House in order to do this. Mm -hmm. So Bob Kennedy was going to reopen that whole mm -hmm. case. Okay. He was also going to follow through on his brother's commitment to cut the oil depletion allowance 27.5%, mm -hmm. which the oil men were getting after every barrel. And he thought it was incredible. He was going to end the war in Vietnam. Okay. Bobby was, uh, uh, like J Jack became, Bobby was uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. he, they, they just couldn't allow this, this man to take the White House over. Now, his assassination happened after, I remember watching on television as a child, his victory in the California Democratic yes, primary. Yes. He was heading to Chicago to the National yes, Convention to become yes. the candidate of probably President of the United States yes. to, to at least confront uh, uh, Richard M. Nixon in that race, right? And yet, um, his life was ended by, it was said, somebody by the name of Sirhan Sirhan. Now, you do not think that's true. In fact, you represent Sirhan Sirhan, the, uh, again, accused and convicted assassin. So here is the anti-assassination yeah. activist, the person who's investigated this, the personal friend of Martin Luther King, who, in two major assassinations, that of, your, of Martin Luther King, your own friend, and of Robert Kennedy, a your friend and a close associate of Mr. King, you are now representing or have represented both these assa uh, convicted assassins. How, how does that happen? Well, remember, Bobby and uh, I ran Bobby's campaign in '64 in mm -hmm. Westchester County, New York. It's just the, the I knew the whole. I knew the family. I knew uh -huh. them well. Mm -hmm. And um, Bobby changed from the time I knew him in '64. From the time he became a presidential candidate in '68. What changed? Bobby him? changed. What changed? He went him? to West Virginia and he saw he saw shoeless kids. He went to Mississippi and he saw kids sleeping on dirt floors. Bobby Kennedy came from an elite family that had no concept that this was how mm -hmm. masses of Americans lived. Bobby changed. I didn't like the original Bobby. I thought he was better than Keating, who was his opponent. And, I w and, and uh, Teddy Sorensen came up and said to me at one point when I got so frustrated with Bob, he said, Bill, you got to stay on in this case. You know, you know he's better than Keating. And all. Uh, <laughs> and I did, but the Bobby who ran in 68 was different from the Bobby I knew. Mm -hmm. And uh, I regret the fact that I didn't really know him in 68 and spend time with him and, and in a sense work on that campaign. But he was a dangerous man to those powerful interests. Sirhan, Sirhan, why didn't he, why, why wasn't he, he, I, he was there photographed with the gun next to the president. No, he, 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 he was, uh, <laughs> he was, he was in the pantry. 
He was brought into the pantry. He had been pro This is in the hotel where Kennedy yeah, was being the led through hotel. after his victory speech yeah. where he was ambushed and killed. He had been profiled. He had been he spent two weeks in a CIA clinic, a mind control Sir clinic. Handed. Sir handed. And and I uh, had Dan Brown from Harvard spend seventy hours with Sir Han over a period of three years and Dan said there's no question that he was a he was a victim of uh, what we can loosely call mind control. But Another patsy? Yeah. This oh, this total, total. That's his three. Total this is Lee Harvey Oswald who claimed himself he was a patsy before he was shot. Yeah, I don't know much about the whole Oswald, Jack Kennedy one, but Sirhan was clearly, uh, clearly uh, set up and mind controlled. And uh, look, all of the evidence is stronger for his innocence than it was for James O'Reilly. When the family came to me, Sir Hans' brother came to me, his lawyer died. And they said, look, will you take this case? I said, I don't, I don't need another one of these. Mm. They only cost you money. You don't make right. any money on these cases, right? right? I can't tell you how much money the King case cost me. They only cost you money. I said, I don't. Then the, but they showed me the evidence. Twelve witnesses swore Sir Han was always in front of Bob. Always in front, through the whole thing. Six other witnesses swore after the mm -hmm. second shot his hand was pinned to the table. He kept pulling the trigger and the bullets went all over the place. But his hand, he had no control over the gun. Okay. You understand that? Uh, Bob was hit with three bullets from the rear at powder burn range in an upward angle. The guy who shot Bob was down on the floor and took the gun and fired three bullets and actually fired four. One went through his shoulder pad. And Sir Han was always in front, never behind. And after the second shot, he yeah. didn't even have control of the gun. And Robert Kennedy was shot from behind, just in the back of the behind. head. Behind. Well, the, the two bullets went in, in, into his back and one went into, into his neck and the one went into the brain uh, like, like this. Sir Han, no way physically he could have done this, aside mm -hmm. from anything else. The next step is his lawyer, Grant Cooper, was under a pending indictment himself mm -hmm. at the time. He blew the case. He threw it off. He didn't investigate the ballistics. He conducted no investigation of the case. Why was that? Because he himself was subject to an indictment. And they, without a doubt, told him, this is what's got to happen. He threw mm -hmm. the case. Now, Sirhan is still in, in prison, right? He's still, still alive. In he's still in prison, right? Yeah, he's in prison. Are you trying to get him out still? Of course, we're. Uh, we Where's that a case lay? Where is the Sirhan? Oh, uh, we have a f we have a, a, a pending a habeas corpus petition before the court. We have a magistrate who has blocked uh, blocked it from the beginning. We will probably lose at the federal district court level. They change judges on us, and we'll have to go to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The tr All we want is this, a very simple thing. Just g give us an evidentiary hearing. Let us put forth all the evidence. Mm -hmm. That has never happened. Since 69, that has never happened. And they're not giving that to you? Well, they want to block it. Uh, what they do to cover up these kinds of situations is that they get you on procedures. Mm -hmm. They try to get you on procedural issues. Oh, you filed too late. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, which okay. is what happened with the previous lawyer. Oh, you're in default here. There. It's, it's rubbish. That's okay, rubbish. we're uh, this is Let Them Talk. I'm Paul DiRienzo speaking with William Pepper, who is the attorney. As you've heard, he was the attorney uh, for the assassin who was, or the, the accused assassin who was convicted in the Martin Luther King case. He was also and is the attorney for the accused and convicted assassin of his friend Robert F. Kennedy. So uh, we are now in the last three or four minutes of this program. Wrapping up, I want to try and bring it to, because I have a copy of a book and, and I was at a presentation where you spoke about it. It's not a book you wrote, you have written some books. What are some of the books you've written? Well, I wrote a book called Orders to Kill, which was the first work I did on the King case um, up to 1995, all the evidence we had. And then um, I wrote a second book on that case called Act of State. And there is a third book, which is the end of the trilogy that will mm -hmm. uh, that will come out. So I've written books on those cases. I've not written any anything on, on the Robert Kennedy case. I've just 
been mm -hmm. the lawyer on that one. But you have been talking about this uh, this book, Mary's Mosaic, by Peter Janey. We only have a couple of minutes, but this is about a mysterious death that occurred to a very interesting person mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., 49 years ago, like almost today. And this is the, um, to just, we don't only have a few minutes, but here is an interesting picture of the subject of the case of this book over here uh, with President Kennedy, with whom she was a lover. And they were lovers and were, were having an affair together. And uh, according to, uh, uh, to Timothy Leary, they did LSD together and smoked marijuana together. Uh, but they were very close and was, of all his mistresses, the one he really loved. I believe so. I believe Jack Kennedy was uh, everything that I've learned and that Peter Janney has uncovered indicates that uh, 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 after the second term, Jack Kennedy would have married Mary. Mm -hmm. I don't think he ever loved a woman as much as he did her. She was one of the most remarkable women in 20th century American politics. And, and uh, I'm sorry we don't have more time actually to talk about that, but I have su I've developed such respect and regard for her and her strength. She turned Jack Kennedy, she was so bright, so committed from a, a cold warrior into an advocate for peace. She was behind his American University speech. She moved him to deal with Khrushchev. She was a powerful, powerful woman. Had been married to Cord Meyer, who was a senior guy at the CIA. Uh, divorced him in 57 because she couldn't put up with it anymore, what they were doing. And after Jack Kennedy was killed, she waited until the Warren Commission report came out. And when that came out, and she was appalled by the fact that it didn't deal with the truth of what happened. She went to her ex-husband, and I believe also to Jim Angleton, another senior CIA guy. So if you guys don't tell what, how Jack Kennedy was really killed, then I, I'm going to blow the whistle on you and all you're doing. So she was herself uh, assassinated um, in a towpath in a, near the canal in Georgetown in 1964. And uh, they killed her. She had, uh, she, she had, she knew too much, and she was so passionate. W w one might say unwise, yes, perhaps, but so passionate was she committed to uh, mm -hmm. uh, to this. You believe Timothy uh, Leary's story that they did LSD together? I I think there's no question that Leary gave her the acid, and she took Jack on at least one, uh, Jack Kennedy on at least one uh, acid trip. And I think she opened up this man like uh, he had never been before. And, and he changed during this whole period. She spent so much time with him. Thank you very much. We must go. William Pepper, check out Mary's Mosaic, Peter Janey's book, and thank you very much. You're welcome.